Okay, so welcome to the uh, second panel uh, of our symposium. The title of this uh, session is Pan-Asian Travelers. Uh, we have uh, three distinguished speakers today in this uh, session. The first speaker will be uh, Professor Selçuk Esenbel, who got her uh, PhD in Japanese history from Columbia University, who is now a professor emeritus at Boğaziçi University. And she is the founding director and current academic coordinator of the Asian Studies Center at Boğaziçi University. And she's also a founding director of the Confucius Institute at the same institution. Her publications include Japan on the Silk Road, Encounters and Perspectives of Politics and Culture in Eurasia, Japan, Turkey, and the World of Islam, published in 2011, the Rising Sun and the Turkish Crescent, New Perspectives of Japanese-Turkish Relations, uh, published by Boas University Press in 2003, and so many other, of course, publications. Uh, the title of her talk is uh, Shades of Meiji Japanese Pan-Asianism, the Istanbul Merchant Yamada Torajiro's uh, Toruko Gakan, a pictorial look at Turkey, and General Utsunomiya Taros Diaries Weave of Ottoman Turkey. And the second uh, speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Er Erdal uh, Yalçın. Uh, Erdal Yalçın completed his PhD at Boğaziçi University Department of History. And he, he carried his doctoral research as Numata Research Fellow at Ryokoku University Research Center for Buddhist Cultures in Asia between 2009 and 10. And he was a postdoctoral researcher uh, at uh, Japan Foundation Japanese Studies Fellow at Tokai University between 2013 and 14. Currently, uh, he's teaching Japanese history, Asian history, and Japanese translation giving Japanese translation courses at the Asian Studies Center at Boğaziçi University. He is also a research affiliate at Koch University Center for Asian Studies. He is the founder of Musashi Dojo, combining the study of the Book of Five Rings with Japanese calligraphy, the editor-in-chief of Global Perspectives on Japan, an annually published academic journal in English, and he is the author of books in Turkish, including Miyamoto Musashi and the Book of Five Rings, published in 2021, The Samurai, published in 2019, and Count Otani Kozui and Turkey, published in 2010. And our third and last speaker will be uh, Professor Miyuki Aoiki Girardelli. Uh, she is an art historian an assistant professor uh, at Istanbul Technical University. Her field of research is East-West encounters in visual arts, especially in Japan, the Ottoman Empire and France. She curated exhibitions on Ottoman Japanese interactions, including the Crescent and the Sun, three Japanese in Istanbul, uh, Yamada Torojiro, Ito Chuta, and Otani Kozui. Sorry, my, uh, I don't know Japanese, so sorry if I'm making so many pronunciation mistakes. And another uh, exhibition titled Japanese Wind in the Ottoman Palaces. Uh, yes, these, and the title of her talk will be Orientalism in the East, the Ottoman Experience of Japanese Diplomat, Watanabe Hiromoto in 1876. So let's start with our uh, first speaker. Uh, uh, Salchuk Ojan, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share the screen. Sure. And uh, by the way, each speaker has up to uh, 40 minutes uh, and which will allow us to have at least a half an hour for Q and A. And you know, our participants can write down their questions to the chat box, or they can also, after all presentations, they can also ask questions directly to the speakers. Okay, um, please don't be put back by the hefty text. 
uh, in the PowerPoint because, I mean, I'm not necessarily going to read it, but I do want to expose uh, some of the text and also some of the aesthetic um, calligraphy and poems, which I think also um, contribute to the uh, topic of uh, shades of Pan-Asianism. I chose the term shades uh, because uh, I'm talking about the late 19th century and the very early 20th century. Now, Pan-Asianism, as we have seen uh, in the two um, great lectures of uh, Swen and Chris, has many, you know, currents and perspectives, debates and individuals and so on. It all coagulates into a very, you know, radical uh, political and international stance in the 30s. But until the 30s, and especially in the major period, we're really talking about ideas, um, discourse, uh, texts, networks, which I think is very important, and some institutional affiliation. So it's not sort of like a monolithic one pan-Asianism that boop, suddenly, you know, props up. So hence the term shades, which I thought, you know, might um, explain a bit my concern for discrete traces of pan-Asianism in the beginning. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to look at two sources selected from the late Meiji period related to Ottoman Turkey, the Turks, and the world of Islam, concepts that the uh, authors have used at that time, because these two works offer different shades of major Pan-Asianism. And most important, still, when Pan-Asianist attitudes still remained well within the major government's overarching uh, establishment policies. In other words, personally, as individuals, people might be critical of the major establishment's uh, worldview and policies, but they didn't do something about it like creating a you know, coup d'etat or rebellion or something like that. They're, they're working in some corner of the larger major, if you will, you know, establishment, although they have counter-establishment views, clearly. But after 1905 Japanese victory in the Russo-Japanese War, Utsune Miyo's diary reveals strategy that was increasingly divergent from the official foreign policy of the Gai Musho and the recruitment of a new network of locals that was different from the age of Yamada Torajiro, who had acted as an honorary council for Japan. So for me, 1905 is a kind of breaking point. You know, that's when sort of like a parallel Pan-Asianist active strategy starts coagulating. The comparison, in my opinion, helps me because it foretells the birth of parallel but divergent strains of Japanese policy, strategy, attitudes that continue towards Turkey the world of Islam, the Turkic world connected uh, to it, you know, even today. So, you know, what began is a kind of, you know, multiple current in the major period. I can still detect that today in different groups of Japan who have different and competing perspectives of uh, Turkey and its connected worlds uh, globally. So our first source is Toruko Gakan, uh, a pictorial look at Turkey, published originally in 1911 of Yamada Torajiro, the resident Japanese merchant of Ottoman Istanbul. He's not a traveler, actually. He's a resident. He lived in Istanbul about 15 years. So the book briefly introduces Turkey, the Turks, and Yamada's everyday observation of the sights, sounds, monuments of Constantinople, Istanbul street life for the educated Japanese reader. It's not an intellectual book. It really is more in the vein of being a kind of, you know, cultural, if you will, expose of the Ottoman Fender Circle world, 
world to the, you know, educated Japanese visitor. If they read this book, well, they'll get some idea about the world that they are visiting, so to speak. This is what the book looks like in the original. Uh, this is the cover page. And this is my translation, annotated translation that just came out actually in November, 2021, a couple of months ago. Uh, so the main text, uh, let me also talk about the book itself because it's important. Uh, the whole text actually uh, in uh, its digital form, it's 180 pages. Uh, Yamada himself wrote 117 pages talking all about, he says it's about Turkey, but he's talking about, you know, Ottoman Istanbul. That's his venue from which he sees Turkey, okay? Uh, that's 117 pages. And then you have 15 pages of a look at the past section at the end of the book, which talks about the September 16, 1890, the Ottoman frigate Arturo disaster with the survival of only 69 out of a total of 650 officers and crew. So this is a very well-known event. I'm not gonna go into the details of that. It's the tragedy that, you know, sort of catapulted relatively closer relations between the Ottoman, uh, leadership and uh, government and that of Meiji Japan uh, in the late 19th century. Yamada describes his arrival after the Arturo disaster in Istanbul via Egypt in 1892 and the excuse of uh, the handing over the aid money that he had collected in Japan from fundraising talks to the Ottoman authorities. Actually, people had done this earlier. So he's kind of following a sort of uh, public relations, if you will, activity that had already been done because it allows him to sort of introduce himself into the Ottoman world and get permission uh, to reside there. Sultan Abdulhamid II had sent the goodwill mission to Meiji Emperor because obvious, everybody is admiring the rising star of the East. So, you know, he is sincerely trying to find some way, if he can, to form some sort of dialogue uh, with this new impressive, you know, uh, rise of Japan to the global arena. The book also includes 32 pages of numerous elegant calligraphy, poems, letters, essays, of an impressive number of 24 major Japanese top ranking army officers, aristocrats, statesmen, politicians, academic intellectuals, which add significant aesthetic and intellectual value of the book. I'm going to use also these poems and calligraphies in my analysis of shades of Pan-Asianism. By the way, these people, I made a list of them uh, at the back of the book. They are the who's who of Japan at that time, the top elite period political elite, military elite, and cultural elite, if I may say so. The biography of Yamada explains why, in a very discreet way, he feels more comfortable with the pan-Asianist network that is burgeoning in Japan at that time. This is my personal interpretation. Uh, he comes from Numata domain, a tiny little Fudai domain very close to Edo, and his grandfather and father were the Karo, which means the top ranking samurai official uh, of the domain. But in 1868, they lost everything. So I might say that Yamada is quite typical of, you know, probably many Japanese who are not in the in circles of the new regime. They cannot be because they have a history of having been just too loyal to the Tokugawa. So the best they can hope for is maybe survival with a new identity. His new identity was uh, to be educated through a family relative with the surname Yamada as the eighth Iemoto, which means master of the Sohen Ryu Tea Ceremony School, a very old fashioned traditional 
uh, ekol of tea ceremony, which still continues in Kamakura today. Uh, and in a way, it shows Yamada, 16 years old young man, he was kind of being farmed out. Uh, in the Tokugawa days, they didn't need to do that, you know, but now he needs to find a new professional and social identity. So this is considered to be sort of like uh, the best thing to do. But in 1892, Yamada, in my opinion, abandons his tea ceremony duty. He probably just doesn't think it's interesting. He's 23 years old. Come on. Uh, he, he sees the whole world in front of them. Major Japan has opened up the vistas of the average Japanese person and young men, they want a kind of global experience. They want to go out. So he partners with the retired naval officer Nakamura Kenjiro of Osaka, a wealthy family. And they both decide to establish a business in Ottoman Istanbul. Why? Because nobody else is there. You know, they're avoiding competition. In other words, they will be privileged as the pioneers of this commercial network. Both of them used the opportunity after the September 16, 1890 disaster, which was really given quite widespread coverage in the Meiji press. And like the others, Yamada collects donations through making public speeches, gets a recommendation letter and introduction from the captain of the Japanese frigate that had brought back the Ottoman survivors one year before in 1892. So let's look at his career. His career, in my opinion, represents the links between, he's not a member of the top establishment. He's not a power broker. He's not somebody who's in an in circle. He cannot be, but he links himself to the establishment, both in Japan and in Ottoman Turkey. Uh, and through his business activities and other business activities, he serves the Gai Musho, which means the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the Imperial Army, especially the general staff, and the Taiwan colonial government, on and off, as part of his career in Istanbul. Uh, the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Gai Musho, foreign policy towards the Ottoman Empire was in a quagmire. It remained constrained due to the Western orientation of the ministry. Now that's one Japanese attitude, okay? That insisted on extraterritoriality in a potential treaty between Japan and Turkey. The Ottoman government simply refused to sign uh, and go along with this. Why Guy Musho insisted on this is because they wanna do everything according to European international law and in 1894, Japan's treaty revision will abolish extraterritoriality in Japan. Therefore, from a legal point of view, Japan is a Western power. And they want to prove that in Ottoman Istanbul because the Ottoman Empire is still not quite a Western power in terms of its international treaty relationship with the major powers of the West at that time. Was Yamada a pawn for the guy Musho? I know that's rough language to use, but you know, he claims, we can't prove it, but in his autobiography and in other writings uh, associated with his publications, he claims that foreign minister Aoki Shuzo, uh, who had had a hand in the treaty revision of 1894 later on, encouraged him to go to Turkey to start relations. Now, we can't prove this, but I'm not about to say that, you know, since he's insisting on this information so much that he's lying or something. It's a family memory that Aoki Shuzo encouraged him to go to Turkey right after the disaster of 1890. And we see a connection because this is confirmed in the Ottoman archives as well. As the minister of Japan in Berlin, Aoki will visit Istanbul immediately. One year after Yamada arrives in 1893 and use Yamada's residency to request formally extraterritoriality from the Ottoman authorities for a future treaty. In other words, he uses Yamada's example. He says, Monsieur Yamada, 
he doesn't have any legal status in your country. So why don't you give us the privileges of the British embassy? And we'll set up a legation in Istanbul. And therefore, Monsieur Yamada will have the privileges of British merchants. Well, nobody's buying that in the Ottoman sublime port at that time. So very politely, the Ottoman authorities just simply ignore and answer al uh, with a negative. Now, um, when you look at his you know, uh, career uh, and uh, you look at his perspective in Toruko Gakan, you can see that Yamada has a very good wide network this is his network with local elites, uh, with the um, uh, Turkish officers, Ottoman bureaucrats, Istanbul Greek business community, the Levantine European residents of Istanbul. So he, he is a sort of active member of downtown Istanbul, having connections to a lot of local communities. And he, Think he gives importance to this. Uh, the store that he and uh, Kenjiro founded, named Nakamura Shoten, sold luxury items to these people. Porcelain. Most of the porcelain in the uh, palaces, a lot of them were purchased from the store, actually. Silk and the like that uh, befit uh, the Japone current in Istanbul that Miyuki was talking about. He continued a long lasting relationship with Turkey. So after he returned back to Japan in 1905 to the end of his life in 1857, uh, Yamada always made sure that he has good relations with the embassy in Tokyo, and that he's always, you know, the chairman of a Turkish Japanese friendship association, heading uh, the Turkish Japanese trade association. In other words, for him, Turkey is basically establishment, local elite Turkey, if you will. In terms of uh, economic uh, uh, activities, uh, Yamada's firm exported Turkish tobacco to the Japanese tobacco monopoly in service of the Imperial Army, who actually distributed freely cigarettes uh, to uh, Japanese soldiers at the battlefield. He founded a cigarette rice paper firm, again for the army, because they needed cigarette, the rolling uh, paper made from uh, rice, actually. And he continued that business, actually, until 1945, a lucrative brief business. Briefly, the same store also exported opium to the Taiwan colonial government that uh, imported opium from uh, the Ottoman uh, opium producing provinces in order to use it in its clinical trials, trying to eradicate opium addiction in uh, the colony, uh, Taiwan, that Japan uh, acquired in 1895. Uh, there's also a moment during the Russo-Japanese War where Yamada and his partner Nakamura send information on the passage of the Black Sea Russian volunteer fleet from the Straits uh, to sail ultimately to uh, the Battle of Tsushima during the war. And this is at the request of uh, Consul General Ijima of Odessa, the Ukraine, and also uh, Minister Makino Novaki of Vienna. Uh, Yamada is not a spy. But like many Japanese uh, citizens around the world at that time, he is quite typical of the amateur intelligence gathering and information gathering that a lot of overseas Japanese uh, actually practiced uh, during the Russo-Japanese War. Now, now let's look at his pan-Asian connections. Um, when I look at Yamada carefully, with whom he became, if you will, friends, who protected him, with whom he sort of formed his entry into Japan's newly made top elite. It starts with Konoe Atsumaro, the founder of Toa Dobunkai, which uh, uh, both uh, Chris and Sven spoke about quite liberally. 
He explains in his own introduction that Prince Konoe Atsumaro, whom he helped during uh, the latter's visit to Istanbul, encouraged him to write on Turkey. In fact, literally, he says, in the past years, on the advice of Prince Konoe, I have written many articles, and he did. We can find them in the journal Tayo and other publications of the late Meiji period about Turkey's customs and traditions and conditions, and publish them in newspapers and magazines. So he explains the book Toruko Gakan. He says, when I was compiling this book, I reworked a lot of it and expanded it with attachments. In other words, he sort of cites Prince Konoe as his mentor, if you will, inspiration. Uh, uh, you know about Prince Konoe's significant role, Toa Dobunkai, which also increasingly will be educating and graduating Japanese specialists on China, Korea. Uh, the intention of the prince was to form close relations between Japan and China. But in the end, many of these graduates came to be used as the intelligence agents, information gatherers on behalf of the Imperial Army, certainly in the 20th century. So this is a kind of cultural side, you know. Uh, Yamada is not an intelligence agent, but you know, he is comfortable uh, with the worldview and the network that Konoe offered to him. He also belonged to General Torio Koyata's Chuseito, which is a enlightened new conservatism movement. At the end of the 19th century, he, we think that he became a member of the party very briefly before he came to Istanbul because he published an article uh, for the Chusei uh, publishers uh, that is associated with this political movement. General Torio Koyata argued against extreme westernization. And therefore, he was a kind of what uh, Chris was talking about, a conservative on the one hand, but with some liberal ideas too. He believed in parliamentary, for example, politics. But he also believed in total commitment to an emperor-centered uh, polity for Japan. At any rate, he and Tani Takeki, the two generals at the end of the 19th century, they are uh, vocal critiques of the Meiji establishment, policies of international relations, of their uh, Anglo-Japanese alliance. They're very you know, sort of nervous about that, which is gonna be signed in 1902. Uh, when you read Yamada's article, he didn't publish too much, you know, he's a businessman, but this article is very interesting. It argues against the swift liberalization of Japanese society with treaty revision. Mind you, in 1894, Japan will revise the treaties, but this article was written before that in 1889 on the year of the proclamation of the Meiji constitution. And he warns, that the Ottomans had signed a treaty back in 1838, the Anglo-Ottoman trade treaty, and he worries that a similar treaty would simply turn the Japanese people into being cheap labor for foreign capital, that the Japanese will simply become uh, the laborers of top European capital that will pour into Japan and kind of semi-colonize it, if, in other words. He was also associated with General Torio because remember, although he's not practicing it, he is a tea ceremony master. Uh, occasionally in Istanbul, he says that he actually performed the tea ceremony to people in the palace and also to the top elite of Istanbul, using the tea ceremony as what today we would call cultural diplomacy. Uh, General Torio was the first president of the Dai Nihon Chado Gakkai, which is the, you know, um, Greater Japan uh, Tea Ceremony Way uh, Association. So there is that kind of tea ceremony, the traditional arts, and that identity, which kind of goes harmoniously well with an attitude of uh, enlightened conservatism, if you will. His perception, when you look at the chunk of the book itself, 
his perception of the Ottoman world, by the way, he never uses the term Asia. So I wouldn't consider Yamada as smack in the center of Pan-Asianist discourse, but he's comfortable with the kind of Pan-Asian rhetoric and networking that's emerging in the late uh, Meiji period. He frequently prefers to use the term Toyo. That is to say the Orient, but the Orient here in his mind is not the Orient of Edward Said. It's the Orient of classical civilizations of Asia. He is thinking of classical China, the Tang Dynasty, and his cosmopolitan unification of uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia during the Middle Ages. So uh, he is looking at the Ottoman capital, its vistas and aesthetic scenery, ancient monuments and all of that, and incorporating it into what he thinks is desirable as Toyo. You see this in his comments. He says, for example, Topkapu Palace is perfect, suitable for Toyo taste, for somebody like us from Toyo. We admire the aesthetics of Topkapu Palace. And he also is insisting upon, in many of his you know, uh, comments, on trying to argue they, meaning the Turks, are like us, you see. We are part of this Toyo, you know, frame. Uh, sometimes he exoticizes the Turks, but much rarely compared to, say, the accounts of Europeans residing or traveling through Istanbul. You know, there are some sections where you can say he's definitely otherizing or exoticizing, but those are kind of minimal in the whole text. And he's constantly trying to explain local Turkish culture, that's the term the terminology that he uses. It is just like ours. For example, uh, Ramazan holiday, and he knows the Turkish name for it, he calls it the sugar holiday, is just like a Japanese New Year's family gathering. They behave just like us. And then he says the local Muslim belief, which by the way, still continues to this day, uh, the giant saint of Yusha Hill on the Bosphorus is just like the Japanese folkish belief in Gekka Hyojin, which is the uh, legend about a matchmaker uh, for happy marriage. And that the street culture of Istanbul is just like his childhood in Edo, the sights and sounds, uh, the sort of uh, voices, the cries of the street sellers. It reminds him of his childhood in Edo. Maybe it no longer is the case in at least downtown Tokyo uh, by that time. But his love of the Orient is tempered with Yamada's commitment to contemporary civilization and enlightenment. He is a Meiji, you know, individual. So he is very much in favor of today. Uh, we admire the past, but we don't act like the past. For example, his narrative about the 1453 Turkish conquest of Constantinople is very uh, much in negative terms, showing it as the merciless warrior culture of a bygone era. We don't, we don't associate with that world today. Uh, he criticizes Muslim conservatism towards women and laments the fact that Turkish women live secluded lives because of tradition. But he says he is enthusiastic about recent progressive reforms. In other words, he's a pro-Ottoman reform observer. He says, in fact, in one section, Ottoman reformism today is softening the tradition of hard religious attitude towards foreigners. So it's having a positive impact. But at the same time, like many Europeans, he is critical of the slow, inefficient administration of the Ottoman bureaucracy, and he is critical of corruption and mismanagement. So this is not all one beautiful image that he is citing. But progressive Ottoman Istanbul offers better conditions than typical Asian societies. First of all, they have a royal archaeology museum which is very impressive. There is still nothing like that in Tokyo at that time. 
There's the war college. He's impressed with the war college. That the common people of Istanbul, this was probably true, eat good food, better food than the common people in Asian societies. And that the scenery and the cultural monuments of the imperial capital is simply just glorious and beautiful. Impressive monuments, cosmopolitan street life and people, that impresses him that there are people of so many nations living in Istanbul at that time, that Istanbul has good quality drinking water and that people enjoy going to the evening theater during the Ramazan fasting month. So these are the positive sides, if you will. Now let's look at the list of, I'm gonna whisk through this, contributors with calligraphy, kanshi, uh, classical Chinese poems, and Japanese uta, uh, poems that reflect what I call geo poetica. I borrowed the term from Harsha Ram about the imperial sublime, you know. Uh, if it had been only a couple of poems, I would have dismissed these writings, but 24 people responded to Ramada's request to, you know, activate their imagination about Turkey and the Turks in poetry. Now, that causes, it seems to me, a rather relatively representative discursive, uh, if you will, uh, language that the Japanese are talking among themselves. This is not for the Turks, it's for themselves. How they see the Ottoman Empire, they call it Turkey. How they see the Turks, what do they predict for its future? As you can see, they are all really members of the top elite, you know, uh, of uh, major Japan at that time. And that's why I think their writings are relatively significant. Among them, some of them, like Tokto Misoho, uh, are very well-known Asianists. In other words, they are people uh, who definitely were active in Asianism uh, during the late 19th century. A member of again, Yosha Sasa Tomofsa, for example, uh, who frequently communicates with Yamada. So let's start off with the uh, preface of Baron Sakatani Yoshiro, the first contribution to the book, which clearly states an Asianist vision of Turkey. He says, since this country called Turkey has spread to both continents of Europe and Asia, the country's share is located on the banks of the strait between the two. In other words, this is the land where the world powers have fought to have it. Because those who ruled here have mastered all four parts of the world, therefore the ruler of this place has changed hands many times since ancient times. Sometimes Europeans ruled it as their own land. Sometimes the Asians owned it. There's a kind of continental uh, bifurcation in his mind, competition between Europe and Asia for power. The Turks are the latest masters here. So they maintain the power of the Asian people in this corner of Europe, albeit a little bit. So Turks are good because they represent Asian power, actually. However, since the advancement of civilization and science taking place, mostly dominating over the peoples of Europe, the wealth and power of Europe dominates the world, anti-colonial and anti-imperial rhetoric. Leaving aside the Far East, much of Asia is being crushed under the yoke of Europe. In the end, Asia cannot avoid succumbing to the fate of the invading and colonizing its land. However, this I find this to be really fantastic and quite relevant even today. Despite the decay and collapse of its power, Turkey somehow successfully survives that stranger and maintains its own in independence. It should be called a fluke, he says. It's kind of like in this, the gods have willed it or something because there's no reason to explain how they've survived. The poems lament the decline of the Ottomans. Each individual wrote a poem in addition to their, you know, uh, essays. And they all agree, they lament, they are very sad about the decline of the Ottoman uh, Empire. And they all agree on hoping for the revival of the Ottomans. Like the Consul General of Odessa, 
who organized the information gathering operation in 1904, uh, this is my uh, rudimentary translation at the moment, gazing at the golden lace flowers of fall, I'm saddened at the decline of that old great power, hoping that its nation will rise again. There's always this hope that somehow its nation, the Turks will rise again. Allusion to classical Chinese metaphors, the Bosphorus, for example. Uh, the description of the vistas of the city is very classical Chinese. It's turning the city into something like the imperial capital of the Tang dynasty uh, in terms of its language. So imposing the view, shakes the universe still, swallowed uniting Asia and Europe the ground of the dragon's footsteps. That's the Bosphorus. And as you know, the dragon represents power, global power. And when we look at calligraphy, when clouds clear up, we see the moon. So don't worry, you know, uh, tomorrow sun will shine. This is the calligraphy of uh, Yasumasa, who is actually uh, Fukushima Yasumasa, uh, Colonel, uh, organizer of uh, intelligence in Asia during the Russo-Japanese War and later an important general in the general staff. Now let's briefly look at the second source, which will look quite different to you. The diary of General Utsunomiya Taro. How does general now, right about the same time as Yamada, but right after the war, you see, he develops now a strategy. Pan-Asianism and Islam have to bond in Imperial Japan's geopolitical strategy towards Ottoman Turkey. This is Utsunomiya Taro himself. His career is also very well known. He was the naval attache during the Russo-Japanese War. He had a hand previously in uh, uh, <clears throat> preparing the Anglo-Japanese alliance of 1902. Uh, but later on, he will become the commander of the Korean army after the annexation of Korea in 1910. Uh, he's a very complex individual. There are a couple of publications now that came out in Japan. Even though he had to harshly suppress the Korean protests for independence uh, in uh, 1919, but still he was, believe it or not, a sincere believer in Asian unity. And for that, Korea and Japan had to unify first. In fact, he advocated in his diary, he says, I want to become a naturalized subject of Korea, give up my you know, Japanese uh, citizenship and become a Korean so that I can work hard for this unification, so to speak. His untimely, untimely death is noted due to exhaustion and distress, but the book itself, which is in three volumes, gives us day to day, the general's account of how he funded the 1911 Chinese revolution by giving the money. You see, he's the power of the purse in intelligence. Strategy is Fukushima. Utsunomiya doles out the cash. So he's the one who gave money to Miyazaki Toten, uh, the one who funded Sun Yat-sen in his numerous rebellions against the Qing dynasty. And he's also the one who uses now a term that Yamada never uses, or for that matter, the writers of his book, to his book. He uses the term kaikyo seisaku. I think this term is being invented right about then at the turn of the century, which means Islam policy. Japan should have an Islam policy. It sounds like the green belt of the United States in the post-war period, in my opinion. The argument is very reminiscent of what the Germans will argue during World War I, what the Americans will argue after 1945. Japan should befriend the Ottoman Caliph Sultan, thus gain global influence over 200 million bloc of Muslim nations who will be grateful. Kind of reductionist, simplistic, but that's, you know, strategy. He vehemently criticized the Gaimusho's policy in line with European international law. In fact, he wrote a paper, P 
petitioning the guy Musho, you should stop this insistence on extraterritoriality. You should just sign a treaty with the Turks and that's it. Let's move on in life, so to speak. Uh, one can see in his diary the origins of the Islam policy, which is linked with Pan-Asianism in the 1930s and will become part of Japan's international activism and strategy during the 30s and, of course, during the war itself. This is the petition that he wrote to the guy Musho, the copy of the petition. And if you look at the, you know, um, argument, uh, he says that, well, first of all, we just have to just ignore this extraterritoriality business. This is too Westernist. This is too uh, pro-Britain. Uh, it doesn't fit Japan's future. So there's a kind of contestation here of establishment foreign policy. And if we do that, you see, the general thinks, if the Turks will be so happy with a treaty on equal terms that they will somehow help us lease territory uh, in the final stop of the German-Turkish uh, railway in Kuwait. Now, this is kind of, you know, if you ask me, he's uh, out of it, you know, I mean, it's, uh, nobody has the power to do that back then, but he thinks it's going to happen. Extend commercial shipping lines from Bombay to the Persian Gulf. I love this one. Open up fertile agricultural land of Mesopotamian Asia Minor to poor Japanese immigration. Like sending immigrants to Peru, why don't we send immigrants to Mesopotamia and Asia Minor? Join the financial investment of the Baghdad Railway, acquire shipping rights on the Tigris and Euphrates. He's an imperialist, as you can see. But he thinks befriending the Turks and Muslims will help the empire, you see? Acquire a port territory at the last stop of the uh, Red Sea Railway. He also supported, like Sun Yat sen, and others, he also supported anti-British, anti-Russian Muslims exiled and um, in political asylum in Tokyo, funding their journey. So among the people that he funded, it was Mavlavi Muhammad Barakatullah, a pan-Islamist socialist and anti-British activist, Ahmed Fazl, former captain of the Egyptian army, pan-Islamist and uh, uh, anti-British, francophone, uh, trusted aid to Utsunomiya. Utsunomiya liked Ahmed Fazl the best of all the Muslim, you know, uh, exiles. Abdurashid Ibrahim, the famous Tatar activist, pan-Islamist from Romanov, Russia, religious figure, well-known, and uh, by now, a lot of publications I just mentioned, you know, the translation of his diary, Japonia, by um, Komatsukari. Uh, Utsunomiya, by the way, funds him, but doesn't like him, says he's not to be trusted. And here in the diary, we also have a record of the signature of the Muslim oath with the foundation of uh, the Asia Gikai society, uh, joined by Chinese Muslims, young Japanese army officers, Japanese Pan-Asianists of the uh, Kokuryukai Association, and a couple of Indian Muslims. This is a photograph of uh, the scroll that they signed in a very formal ceremony in 1909. And so we have an account of it in the diary, and we have an account of it in the memoirs of Ibrahim himself in Turkish. So one Japanese source and one Turkish source here. In his return voyage back to Istanbul in 1909, again, supported by Doa Dobunkai and also the Imperial uh, General Staff, Second Bureau of Utsunomiya, uh, Ibrahim accompanied Omar Yamoka Kotaro, trained as a Russian language agent, served the Harbin Intelligence Bureau, claiming to the state to be the first Japanese convert to Islam teaming up with Ibrahim, giving speeches in Mecca and Medina, meeting with the Arab notables there, and then moving on to Ottoman Istanbul and giving speeches, especially targeting Tatar students studying in the Ottoman capital. Uh, Yamoka spoke in Russian. Ibrahim translated it either into Arabic in uh, Mecca, Medina, or into Turkish in Istanbul. 
So the role of Toa Dobunkai is very clear here, but now it is strategy, okay? It's not the cultural, uh, shall we say, imagination that we see in Yamada. It is strategy, very much strategy. Uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> Utsunomiya's perspective, it comes out bluntly in this sentence that I've uh, translated. He says, commenting on Ibrahim, whom he doesn't like, but he has to fund him, you know. Even though the personality of this Ibrahim is not clear, it will be possible in the future to use him as a tool, dogu, he uses that term, in the manipulation of the Muslim peoples someday with people like the Egyptian captain Ahmed Fazl and the like in the event of a clash with Christian countries. You see, I think that, you know, um, when I read this in uh, conferences in Japan, people were very surprised saying such a religious terminology. Uh, we would expect the general to say something about Western imperialism, Western colonialism. But, you know, I think privately, a lot of Japanese and Pan-Asianists and even maybe beyond still thought of the world in terms of Christians versus non-Christians, not East-West, you know, uh, Europe versus Japan or um, European uh, colonialism versus uh, uh, Asia but also in terms of uh, the politics of religious identity. He sent Ahmed Fazl to uh, Ottoman Istanbul after the 1908 Young Turk Revolution to present to the new Young Turk Ottoman government his proposal for a treaty. By the way, he didn't consult with Guy Musha. He's doing it on his own. The general is sending somebody, an Egyptian, to Istanbul, who was, by the way, a good friend of the Young Turks because they were educated in the same school in Paris, and presenting the proposal of the general, why don't we sign a treaty? No extraterritoriality, I promise you. You know, uh, trying to activate his policy. It doesn't work, okay? But the fact that he moves independent of the Guy Musho, in my opinion, is important because the Guy Musho will desperately do the same only two years later, in 1910, actually. So the second bureau uses uh, uh, Ahmed Fazl's uh, visit to Istanbul also to get a bit of information, okay? And the information that Fazl brings back is a map of the proposed German Berlin Baghdad railway. So the Japanese want to know what the Germans are up to. And they are using this uh, collaborator to get this map. Probably, I'm sure Ahmed Fazl got it from somebody in the you know, uh, war college in Istanbul, who probably was quite uh, voluntary about giving this information to the Japanese. Why not, you know? Uh, <clears throat> so he supports also in 1907, uh, he establishes a Japanese military attache in Istanbul. There is no embassy. There is no consul general, no consulate, but there is a military attache at the forefront of the Gai Musho. In other words, the army is more proactive than the Gai Musho in opening up networks uh, to uh, the people in the Ottoman Empire and with the government, most important. Uh, we have a note in his diary. It says something about um, in 1909, he paid a certain amount of money to a certain nanigashi, the term that frequently uh, the general uses when he doesn't want to divulge exactly the name of the persons who are working for him for some various jobs, who is working in the Nakamura store in Istanbul. Yamada, is not here at this point. He has returned back to Japan. There is a young Japanese staff, Nakamura Eichi, who is, you know, taken over the management of the store. It is still in the name of Nakamura Kenjiro and others, uh, and, uh, you know, in the official records. But uh, we think probably it's this young Nakamura Eichi who did something for the military attache, some kind of services. Okay, so what do we learn from this? 
Let me move quickly to my conclusion. Utsunomiya's pan-Asianist network in Istanbul differs from Yamada's network. When Omar Yamaoka, a Japanese, came to Istanbul in 1910, Nakamura's store was very active. Uh, the military attache is in contact, but Yamaoka avoids visiting the Nakamura store. In other words, this Japanese network does not want to associate itself with the local establishment and the Ottoman authorities in the way that Yamada and his network. It's a different network that the journal is searching for. Yamaoka, in fact, preferred to stay among the Muslims in the more conservative inner city neighborhoods of the capital and particularly form close relations with Tatar student community that the Japanese army favored. Uh, he also met with pan-Islamist statesmen, not all statesmen, but those who are advocates of pan-Islam perspective and intellectuals. In other words, this is a different network now. It's not the same as Yamada's network. So my assessment, major Japanese develop parallel but different concepts, strategies and networks towards Ottoman Turkey and the Turks with shades of Pan-Asianism with implications for today. One, the Westernist perspective of Gaimusho diplomacy miserably fails to sign a treaty, but it continues its international treaty frame and the perspective of Turkey uh, in the region as part of the Western Alliance. We have that network from Japan that looks at Turkey in a modified version of what the guy Musho was thinking back in the days of Yamada. Of course, adapted to you know, 20th century uh, uh, <clears throat> concerns. Second, a Japanese elite empathy for Toyo or Pan-Asia as a cultural and political theme like Prince Konoe Atsumaro, <clears throat> Baron Sakatani, intellectual Tokutomi Soho, the poems, the calligraphy, the link with local elites and business circles continues, in my opinion, to be a cultural Japanese elite vision even today, admiring cosmopolitan Istanbul for its links with the kind of Oriental culture in the, you know, reified and positive sense links with Japan through a kind of, you know, uh, cultural and perhaps even some kind of political camaraderie. Third, the Imperial Army General Staff, Pan-Asian Kumpan Islam pro activism to recruit, this is different than having empathy, to recruit Muslim collaborators, especially from the Russia Muslim emigres and local pan-Islamists in an overt pan-Islam strategy against the Western empires and to use Istanbul as a site for observing Russia. Uh, this strain, Japanese strain, is always very critical of the guy Musho's failure to do this, failure to do that. You know, somehow they really don't have their hand on how, you know, people are thinking. Uh, in um, uh, the context of Turkey. And frequently they avoid contact. This network avoids contact with the establishment in Turkey and Western oriented elites and diverse local communities searching for global allies in the Muslim and Turkic networks that Turkey offers globally. Thank you very much for your patience.